Unmute yourself and tell me if you can see the PowerPoint now that I'm showing. Yeah, I can see your screen. OK, thank you very much. Um, and if you cannot let people in to I, I will not, I can't jump between my PowerPoint and the Teams meeting. So if someone can just allow people to come in if as they are waiting in the lobby. Um, right, I need to go to my PowerPoint to actually show you. I realized last time when you couldn't see my my mouse, I was trying to present the PowerPoint presentation in Teams and that doesn't work. So if, can you see my mouse now if I hover over the first slide? If someone can just unmute and tell me if you can see my mouse. Anyone? You can see your mouse, yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure because last time the mouse didn't save at all. Right, so today the whole idea is to talk about how what do we do with our images and um, how to how do we analyze them. Now, when I started to put this presentation together, I just realized it's almost impossible to go through everything. So I'm going to touch basics. Um, the first part of this of the webinar is not completely what do I do after the imaging, but actually how do I do how do I get good images from the start? Because as you might know from previous experiences, if your imaging from the start isn't good enough, there's almost nothing you can do to get good images if they weren't imaged in the correct way. So the first few slides will be about um, what things in, um, influence the quality of the image. And then I'll get into a little bit of what do I do with those images afterwards. So um, I don't know how many of you watched the video. Um, firstly, I thought um, I'll summarize everything that they said in the video and then I realized, but there's so much. You can watch the video. I will do a few I'll touch on some of the things they said in the video, but um, in general, there are other things that I would also like to show you and which I would also like to go through. So I'd rather focus on those. What I did um, borrow from the video that I asked you to watch, this is the website. Um, you will get this um, slides, of course. So you can go to this website and watch the full video that um, Zeiss has produced on sample analysis. It's a very good video. I have to say it's something that I would recommend all of you to watch at the time that you have to analyze your images. But two of the things that um, I borrowed from the, the video, the one was this image on the left hand side with the block. It looks to you to us like there's a dark block in the top and a light block, a block at the bottom, right? A white, a probably very dark gray top and a whitish block at the bottom that's a bit um, in the shadow. But that, what was very interesting in the video, they said if you put your finger right in, in front of the area here, you would actually see that the color on the top and the color at the bottom is exactly the same. Um, that just shows you that our interpretation of images is not always reliable. We think that there's dark at the top and, and white at the bottom, but in, true, in all truth, if you measure those colors, they are exactly the same. Hence the reason why we, we, it would be good to look at your images, not just with your eyes, but actually doing some digital processing and, and measurements with, with software. On the right hand side, yes, um, they also showed this image. We are not, our, our eyes are not completely useless. We have fantastic eyes and we the way we interpret the images is much better than the machines. If you look at, at the right hand image, there's actually um, a dog um, in, in the shadows. I guess it's in shadows, which we can actually see. But the software will possibly, I doubt if there's any software which would have recognized this as a dog. So we, we as humans can do this. Right, um, sorry, it's just, yeah, that was all I wanted to say about that. So what is digital imaging and and how how is it different from what we do so in digital imaging which is the foundation of all image analysis um, algorithms and everything is the, the the fact that we divide the image screen into many 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 blocks little picture elements picture elements is then shortened to pixels so pixels is all these little blocks and every image even your digital camera your phone camera, everything has has um, little blocks, and we and I think Sune or Anya talked about um, why an SLR camera is 
so much higher resolution in terms of the pixels than a fluorescence camera. Um, but still, the principle is that all images are divided into many pixels. Now, <coughs> each pixel can then get its own little value. We call it a gray value, and I'll talk about it a little bit in the next slide as well. But if you can look here, every slide or every pixel that has a black, completely black color actually has the value of zero. And then the highest value that you can find in this block is a 255. If you want, look at this one, that one there. Yeah, on the right hand side, there are two blocks with 255. And if you correlate that back into this, the blocks, you will see those are all the white boxes. So in other words, a pixelated image have many, many pixels, and each pixel can, can range between black, which is completely dark, no signal, to the maximum number of signal, which is completely white here, with a, a value of 255. Now, why 255? The 255 is linked to the bit depth. Now, not all images might have the, the maximum value of 255. It depends on the bit depth of your camera, of your system. So what is dip, bit, uh, bit depth? If you have a two bit camera, right? It relates to the, the number uh, two to the power of two. Two to the power of two is four which means you have four gray levels. You have black, dark gray, light gray, and white. If you have a six bit, that means two to the power of six, which ends up as 64, um, 64 gray scale levels. Now 64 levels is, you can distinguish it, but in, in fluorescence microscopy, we need to distinguish very, very small differences. For example, you are treating your cells with, uh, um, some uh, stress inducer and then some the re reactive oxygen um, species increase slightly. You need to be able to measure that increase. And sometimes if you have increments that are so this, this wide, a little difference between one treatment and another treatment might not actually show you any, any changes. Therefore, the camera has to have a higher bit depth the most the most con confocals or most of the images that we work with has eight bit um, PMTs or then cameras, which um, if there's a small difference, at least those values of the pixels will change. If you had your your treatment uh, control cells here and the treatment caused a little bit of an increase, you will be able to see that as a numerical change. Um, of course, more the more and more and more bit, bits you have, the higher, the more more changes you'll have. But at some point, it becomes irrelevant. Um, also, because of biology and and normal variation or ver uh, variability, small changes might also just not be worthwhile. So, eight bit um, is a very useful number. Now, eight bit means that there's two to the power of eight gray levels which ends up at 256. So if I put it onto the side, there is a one bit um, channel, um, two bit channel, four bits that would give you 16 and eventually the 256 and eight bit uh, channel with which goes from zero pitch black to the brightest at 256. Now you will see on in many of the software, um, we use Zen, so this is from my Zen program. You have at the minimum a, z a value of zero and at the top a value of 255. This 255 means the maximum value that the, the pixels could have. Now why 255 and not 256? That's just easy. We start with a va value of zero, but the zero is also a value which needs to be recorded. So in the end, if you have 255, um, values plus the zero that you measure, you end up with 256 um, grayscale um, channels. Right, so I hope you understand now what, where this histogram comes from. It's basically um, plotting all the pixels in an image in, in its different colors for the specific gray level that, that it has. The majority of the green here has a gray level of probably probably about 45 
um, intensity. Um, right, so I hope that makes more sense for you. I'm going to, into the Zen program a little bit later and we can, I'll show you a few things about this histogram. Right, next. Um, now, there was a question um, in one of the earlier webinars on the scale bar. And the scale bar immediately uh, reminded me that I want to share with you that all the imaging software that we use on, on microscopes, Olympus, Nikon, Zeiss, uh, Leica, I hope I didn't skip any, <laughs> any of the manufacturers, it's not on purpose if I skip anyone, but all of their software save not only the image and the pixels, it actually saves a huge amount of data. If you watch the video from Zeiss, they, I think they said it saved 476 different, let me just check my, yeah, 476 different parameters of that image is saved in the background of the image, and we call that the metadata. If you need to reach the metadata, you can usually in Zen software, you go to your, your you open your image, and you scroll down or you open the tab here at the bottom, which says info. I will show you in the software as well, but basically it tells you the objective, what specific objective you have, what beam splitters you've used, which lasers were switched on. Yet at the bottom, we can see that there were two tracks in this image and there was 488 nanometers at 2% and 561 nanometer laser at 1.8%, 405 nanometer laser, the panels were differently opened. One panel was 1.8, other one was 2.09. And a lot of the information is saved in the metadata. Another thing that is saved, and this, this links back to the scale bar question, the scaling of this image is also saved in the metadata. You can see here, scaling per pixel means that this image is 130 nanometers, or then 0.13 micrometers, by 0 0.13 micrometers. If this data is not available, your scale bar won't be in, in micrometers. Um, often when someone extracts their data and they save the, the images and they go and, and um, try to put the scale bar in um, afterwards, and the, if the metadata did not save with the, the exported file, the only way you can get the scale bar it, or the scale bar is then um, presented as a line of pixels. It will tell you 100 pixels or 1,000 pixels, which for biology, we, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that the doctor's use is to go back to the raw image and find out the size of each pixel. And if you can import that and say, okay, the pixel size was 0 0.13 by 0 0.13, the, the software that you might use afterwards should then uh, draw a scale bar with the correct um, measurement. And um, yeah, so this scaling is definitely linked to the objective. Each objective's um, uh, representation will be calibrated by the service engineer. So whenever you are on our microscope, it will automatically know, no matter what your zoom factor or anything is, every, every time you present your pixels, it will automatically know what the size um, of that pixel is. All right, other information that's saved is um, things like the coordinates of the picture, um, what was the acquisition parameters, the lasers, etc. Sometimes if you use the software to control the environmental um, conditions like the CO2 or the um, temperature control, that, that could be saved. And then all other in image info, the date, the file name, all things like that can be saved. And something that's very, very important, and that's a principle in um, imaging. You have to keep all your original raw image files until the day that you are not, I want to say, keep it forever. Um, whenever you publish, the majority of the high-end uh, journals, they actually would like you to send them your raw image files, not compressed, not any, no, no editing, no um, processing, just the raw image files. If you have them, you can prove that you haven't tampered with the data, you haven't um, done things wrong um, to, to obscure your data. It's necessary for everyone to be able to go back to their raw image files, and then you can always reprocess or, or re-see re what, what did you use in terms of your um, 
parameters. Right, <clears throat> um, next. Now, the next bit is about how to make sure that when you image, you already image with the best um, parameters, that you don't afterwards struggle to get your images to the best quality just because you haven't really imaged in the best way. So I don't do light microscopy a lot. My own um, specialty speciality is um, fluorescence microscopy, but I've read up and made sure that I have a list here for you in terms of light microscopy. How do we get light microscopy images to be consistent across different days, across different um, experiments? So the first thing, and um, Anya said this in the, one of the first webinars, so if you are not sure how to do the cooler illumination, it is in the first webinar of this series. Cooler illumination makes sure, firstly, that your condenser is in focus, and secondly, that your um, field of view is centered. If it's not centered, you could get shadows on your image, and that would be very difficult to deal with. Um, so cooler illumination is one. The second one is the condenser aperture. Um, you need to keep the condenser apertures the same so that you can get similar um, illumination through to your sample. Um, and I think Anya also talked about condenser aperture in her webinar. The next thing is that you should keep your light intensity. If your cooling illumination and your condenser aperture is the same, then your light intensity across different days should be the same. Something that I also realized <laughs> during a one of or two experiments is that if you've switched on your room light in one experiment, but you haven't switched it on in a different experiment, it might actually influence your light intensity. So always make sure if you work in the light, work in the light always. If you have worked in the dark, for example, when we do fluorescence microscopy and you want to overlay it with the light, a uh, normal transmitted image, the light should always be off. Um, that could influence the light intensity. Um, in general, it shouldn't, but I have seen that it can, can obscure. Um, the recommendation is that you should use the bright light. This is not for fluorescence, but for bright light, you could use a light intensity of about 75%. And this is uh, from one of the sources I've used. Right, um, another thing is that you should try and keep your exposure time, not trying, you, you should aim to keep your exposure time constant. You can do an automatic, uh, um, exposure. Many of the software has some sort of button that says set exposure. You click the set exposure and it will automatically try and get the best quality exposure time for you based on your light intensity, your condenser aperture and cooler illumination. So when you set the automatic exposure time, don't change any of the above three after you've set the exposure time. These things should try should be done more or less in this order. And if you finalize your, your settings, don't go back and change any of the above. When you set the exposure time, it's also important to check that none of your pixels are saturated. In other words, the brightest that it can be. As soon as you are saturating any of the pixels, you will lose some data and you will lose resolution because two or five pixels next to each other, all at the maximum, won't show you any differences between them. They will just be all overexposed. So try and keep your um, saturation of the pixels lower than full saturation. Then white balancing, I have a question. I've had a question on white balancing, which I'll address in the next slide. Um, the recommendation is you oh, wait, let me say this first. Some software um, allow you to pick a point in the background that you can use as a white um, as a white value to to calibrate the whole image with. But the recommendation is that you use full field so that there's no uh, subjectivity in that you've chosen the point um, that might be white, etc. So full field will will be a, a much more objective way to do the white balancing. And then um, you will I will go to gamma setting a little bit later. But if you start imaging, do not change the gamma gamma setting from the from the uh, from starting to image. Keep it linear. The software usually would set it to one and um, do your imaging all at a gamma setting of one. Afterwards, you can edit the gamma setting to be um, to edit the, the images in a way that you will um, visualize the, the images better. Right, so white balancing. Um, what white balancing does 
is to remove the color that comes from your light source, anything in the microscope, um, light bath, your lenses, even your um, dishes, or even or the camera. If there's any yellowing effect or a redness effect, it can take that away <coughs> and, and produce your image in a much more white, uh, with a white background, um, and furthermore in a grayscale um, projection. Now, this should be part of your standardized uh, process before you start imaging, especially this is now for H&E and your typical um, uh, anatomy stains, uh, histological stains. So you would remove this specimen from the stage and then you use the white balancing button in the software and you, um, you can use white, um, you can choose the white balancing effect. This was from one um, source that I've used. You'll see here at the bite bottom, bite size bio. Um, I use bite size bio um, uh, a lot for training. I, they have very, very nice um, little blips of um, information to help you. What is the five most important things to remember in controls? Things like that. So this is a nice source. However, a different source also recommended you can you don't have to take out the stage or the specimen completely. You can move your your stage to a place on this on the slide where you don't have any sample or any any dirt. Then you can use an empty part of the slide as to do your white balancing. So both of those ways are correct. And the, this, the next point is um, answering the question I had. The question was whether we, you have to do white balancing for every single slide that you put on. You start a slide and then you have to white balance every time. The recommendation is that you only perform this once at the beginning of your imaging session rather than um, your imaging session. The, another thing is in the software, rather switch off automatic or continuous white balancing features so that you don't have uh, variability across your imaging for that day. Um, automatic is sometimes useful, sometimes not. In this case, it's recommended that you, you manually perform your white balancing in the beginning, and then you don't do any automatic or continuous white balancing afterwards. Right. <clears throat> now in fluorescence images, the possibly the, one of the most important things um, and one of the things that people struggle with the most is to get a good signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise, in other words, you want real signal as bright as possible, but your background should be basically black. Um, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Then saturation, you have to be very careful that you are not oversaturating your pixels. I've, I've said this in the, in the previous slide as well, but in fluorescence, of course, now you are working with, you could be working with three or four or five colors. For each of those colors, they might need different settings to ensure that you are not overexposing or saturating the pixels of the image. I will show you an example in a minute um, when we go to the software of uh, an image where I've oversaturated the image. Right, contrast. Um, contrast comes from a good signal to noise ratio, but there are ways in imaging where you can improve the contrast to make sure that you have good contrast. And lastly, um, resolution. We've talked a lot about resolution on Monday in our super resolution talk, but that is not the only part of resolution. Resolution that I've talked about on Monday is all optical resolution, it has to do with the wavelength of light. You can't get better than 200 nanometers on a confocal microscope. And with super resolution, you can get down to 10 nanometers, if for those of you, you might remember. Spatial resolution um, is referring to how you actually display these, this data. Because we are working with a pixelated um, screen, we need to make sure that the pixels that we use actually represent what the objectives and the, the, the optics of the microscope have already resolved. And one of my slides will be on this. Okay, so contrast first. Um, how we get contrast in a confocal or a wide field microscope is to increase, or this is specifically based on a confocal microscope with PMTs, because on PMTs you can increase the voltage on the PMT. That's our detector um, system. A, a confocal doesn't have a camera, um, for those of you who are not uh, sure, but we use PMTs which uh, collects the signal. And if you increase the gain, which is the voltage, 
you will increase the signal that um, is reported. So um, if you increase this uh, voltage, you get bright fe features are brought closer to the saturation and the general image brightness is increased. You will see here at the bottom, if you've used the image at 600 volts, you are not saturating the image at all. Uh, this is, imagine you have an image and your brightest image, your brightest pixels are um, represented by the yellow line and your dimmest pixels are represented by the yellow line here. If you have, if you use 600 volts, your brightest pixels are not yet at saturation. So you can increase the gain to 800 vol uh, volts so that your brightest pixels are close to saturation. Again, um, here at the bottom, you'll see that you actually have a lot of noise because your minimum, your dimmest pixels actually doesn't have a value of zero. To make that, uh, to change that um, background noise to zero, you can set what we call the offset. So here in the description, offset sets the gray level of a selected background to zero and adjust the darkest feature in the image to black. This means with his changes in the voltages in changing gain and changing offset, increase the, the contrast. Your brightest images are almost at saturation while your dimmest pixels are basically pitch black. Increased contrast means a better resolution. You can actually resolve small particles um, apart from each other. Next one, good signal to noise ratio. Now, signal can be influenced by many, many things. Firstly, your input intensity. In other words, if you increase your laser or your um, burner, whichever light source you are using, LED, but you increase the intensity, they, therefore you can increase the signal. It is also dependent on the quantum efficiency of your camera, CCD, or your PMT voltage. How sensitive is the um, detection um, apparatus and how much photons does it need to actually uh, reduce, release electrons and how many electrons is released on, on the receival of a photon. Um, so that's quantum efficiency. And then also the integration time. The longer that you keep your, your um, camera aperture uh, you know, open, the more signal you would gather or you would collect and more, more signal or more photons that's collected would result in more signal. Furthermore, um, brightness is also in, influenced by the quantum efficiency of your fluorophore. The more fluorophores you use, or um, quantum efficiency of fluorophore means how many photons excitation light can it receive and then how much electrons does it release, uh, how much energy does it release upon the, the excite, that excitation. So, you get fluorophores that are really bright. They don't need a lot of excitation, but they will be, they will um, have a lot lot of energy um, emitted. And then you get dim fluorophores, which is um, they need higher input excitation to give the same amount of signal. You also get um, transmission through optical si system. If you have any place in your system that actually absorbs the energy and absorbs the light, you will get less brightness than what you would have wanted. The total magnification um, also gives, um, has an effect on the brightness. And lastly, your numerical aperture. As uh, if you remember, numerical aperture of your objective means how much light is it gathering um, while you are imaging. So all of these things um, gives you a good signal and you want the best signal. I haven't even talked about the, the concentration of your fluorophore. You need to do optimization of your concentration that you've used, what, um, how many washing do you need, etc. So always make sure that you get the brightest images that you can with the sample you have. Um, then spatial resolution, um, as I said in the, um, in the introduction here, the spatial resolution means, am I displaying this, um, this image as a 500 pixels and 12 pixels by 512 pixels, or am I displaying this as a 2000 and no, I can't remember what the um, binary value is, but it's like 2000 pixels by 2000 pixels. The 2000 pixels by 2000 pixels will be a lot better resolved spatially than a 512 by 512 image. And I'll show you some examples later on in the software. With a confocal, you have another advantage. 
um, because you're working with lasers and not a cam camera with a certain um, uh, shutter, um, shutter field of view, you can actually set the angle of the, the laser to either only scan a very small area of your sample or a very wide angle of your sample. Um, so the zoom factor will determine the scan angle of the mirrors. The mirrors is where the which directs the laser from left to right in a scanning um, confocal microscope. And then zooming will reduce this angle. It will then reduce the scanned area, which reduces, uh, which results in a reduced pixel size. So um, I will show you that in some examples as well. Um, the image is magnified a lot more if you increase the zoom factor but also your resolution is improved. What does this mean? I'm talking a lot, but I, but it, I guess it, it could be that you're asking, what do, am I talking about? Some people take a very wide image, and then afterwards, once they've done the imaging, they want to zoom into interesting areas. They see a little cell there in the left-hand corner, and afterwards, they would like to zoom into it. If you've taken a wide image, and that image was taken at a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels and you zoom into a small area of a small cell somewhere in the corner that that cell might now be represented by 100 pixels by 100 pixels and you can think for yourself 100 pixels is a lot more pixelated than an image that consists of thousand by thousand so what we suggest is if you know that you are interested in um, nicely zoomed images of cells rather set your zoom factor from the start so that your image is taken only of that cell. What happens in the software is that the cell is now imaged as a thousand by thousand pixel image instead of the whole area being thousand by thousand. And then you don't have to zoom in afterwards because you've already have your resolution on that zoomed image. Okay. I will also show you some examples later on. <coughs> so the improvement of resolution is, however, still limited by the optical resolution of the objective. Firstly, it doesn't matter if you can represent your image in 10 nanometer pixels. If your objective and your system cannot resolve 200 nanometers, you can use as small pixels as you want. It won't work. There's this theorem. It says that it's a Newquist theorem. It says the pixel size should be set to about one half to one third of the minimum spacing that you want to resolve. So, for example, in a in a image that you know that um, image can only be resolved to about 300 nanometers, it's best then to not um, choose pixels smaller than 100 nanometers by 150 nanometers. Otherwise, you are just empty. You you um, they say you are. Um, it's empty magnification. There's no point in um, increasing the the file size just to get to 10 nanometer pixels, which can't resolve any more than 300 nanometers. Right. So noise. We still haven't talked about noise. Where does noise come from? Um, we are working with electronic systems. Lots of uh, lots of electricity, lots of vibrations, and we are eventually detecting electrons. We're not only detecting photons, we, we are detecting electrons. So this, the fact that there is a system full of electrons in any case, there is um, by nature some noise. Now noise, it can be reduced by using colder temperatures. Our cameras here in SAF is co cooled down to I think minus 60 degrees to reduce that noise from electrons. Um, another um, way to look at noise is you can collect dark noise so you can collect this noise by keeping your shutter if you use a camera based system keep your shutter closed and just record if you record for 10 seconds you will get a lot of noise and this is something that um, the, the better the system is the, the less the noise will be some other sources of noise is of course in your sample itself when you have not washed your sample enough if there's uh, autofluorescence in the in the um, mounting medium, autofluorescence in the sample itself. So it's always important to try and, and find out where does the noise come from and how to reduce it as much as pos possible. Otherwise, you won't get good contrast. Right now, unfortunately, um, 
we would all want to be in front of a microscope for the shortest amount of time. We want to do as much as we can with as many uh, with that data. We want to do Z text, um, eight color images. We want to um, acquire for hours, etc. But the thing is that when you um, image, you I always have to decide what is exact. What exactly is my purpose? Why do I want to image? If you want to go for resolution, if you really want to resolve very small structures, you will most possibly, probably not be able to do this at a very fast speed. You will have to um, sacrifice on speed. If you are looking at a lifestyle um, imaging uh, event, for example, mitochondrial um, or, or bacterial movement, you are interested in speed. You really want to follow that um, that uh, event. Uh, another example is calcium flux. Calcium flux happens in seconds. So if you want to image that fast, you will not be able to resolve to get the image at the best resolution possible. So you always have some sort of a compromise. If you are imaging with six colors, you will most probably also not be able to image fast. If you want to image fast, rather choose one one color at maximum two colors. Um, so it's always important to decide what is it that you want to do. Right, I quickly want to exit here, um, stop sharing my screen so that I can go to Zen. Um, oh, if you just bear with me for a second. Zen. Right, um, right. This is an image I should just quickly want to uh, change here one of the settings. Now, this is an image that I often use in um, our training. It's a, a bovine, po bovine pulmonary artery epithelial cells. Um, it's stained with phalloidin and it's stained with hushed, which uh, stains the, or DAPI, I think this is DAPI, but it stains the nuclei and I've got mitotrechons. So I'm just going to try and expand it a bit um, where you can now see, and there's a bit of red. I think some of you might see the red. Now, some of you might have trained eyes already, which can see that this is way too bright. The green has been taken with um, too bright signal. But there is a way in the software to actually show this, for, and this is by showing the range indicator. And you can see there, there's a lot of red spots. All those red spots are pixels that are have a value that of 255, but if we actually have put it in the in the right scale, they might not have been the same intensity. So it's always important to set up your image in a way that it will be less than saturation. You don't want the red spots. The um, blue background tells you that there's no signal. Every pixel that is blue is no signal. In other words, we have a nice black background. So just quickly telling, telling you a bit about the, let me just do, um, get the range indicator off again. Um, unfortunately, the image will be small, but I want to show you some of the features in software. Most software have this kind of, of display, so even if you are not using Zen or Zeiss, you should be able to um, apply what you learn here. Okay, so at the moment we have three channels, green, red, uh, green, blue and red, and each of them are representing one of the fluorophores. So if I'm on red, Currently, I'm displaying the full range of the gray levels from zero all the way to 255. But as you can see on the on the image, we can't really see the red dye. So if you want to make an image brighter, you might choose to represent it in less than its actual full spectrum. So if I remove it from the right hand side to the left, you'll see that the red becomes more Apparent. I'm going to do overdo it so that you can properly see, but this is how we make um, images brighter. I'm not actually changing the data. The data still stays the same. You can see that that graph is still where it was. I'm just choosing to display the pixel or the all the pixels from in a range from zero to 64 uh, grayscale levels. Everything above 64 will all be displayed with the same intensity. Um, then um, I would also like to show you in a different image. I'm going to open a few other images as well. 
for now. Let, let me not do that now. Um, let's see if there's uh, any background. There's no, not much background. Maybe yeah, there's a bit of blue background. So how do I get rid of background? Um, yeah, I can, from the left hand side now, I can choose to move the slider so that everything below this line will be represented as background or will it, we will remove that signal completely. So anything below the gray level of 15 is now displayed as zero black background. If I go back to from range indicator, now the blue should be less. Um, it, it was a very, this is a fantastic sample, so it won't show that that well. In another sample, I'll show it um, soon. So as you also can see, I can edit each image or each color differently. The only thing I can't do, you you know that the green has been overexposed. Let me just quickly switch off the other colors. I've shown you that green is overexposed. There's a lot of red spots. There's absolutely nothing I can do about that. I can remove as much background as I want. It won't change the fact that the, the oversaturated pixels are oversaturated. I can try and slide this one on this side. It's not taking away the oversaturation. So you need to be, be very, very careful of oversaturation at the time of imaging. It doesn't help afterwards. We can do nothing with the image that's already oversaturated. Right. Now, another point here on this scale is the gamma level. Um, I want to show this actually in a different image because I have images that display this bit better. Just go to see um, this one. OK, so this is mouse intestine. It's not a very good sample. That's actually specifically why I'm showing it. Um, I want to focus on the blue. The blue here, which you won't see very well, um, is a um, is from goblet cells. So the goblet cells are very, very dim. There's one there. I um, might not have taken the best example. Let me just quickly see if I get a, get a better example in the list. Um, that might be better. Yeah. I can already see the blue shows up. So um, you can see there, there's blue spots. That's mucus cells in the duodenum. Um, so what I what I can see is I would have to increase to actually see them, but then I've increased the background, and I want to take the background out, and there I have only blue. With gamma, if I increase gamma, yeah, I will include dim samples without increasing the brightest of the bright sample. So I'm going to show this perhaps in the red. Um, let's switch blue off. Uh, possibly also not the best example to show it, but what I would like to show, you can see here yeah, the red here on the, in the um, sheath is quite high. Um, I don't really want to make that brighter. If I just um, use the range indicator, if I make everything just brighter, the first um, pixels that become oversaturated are here in the back. But I do want to show my red here brighter. And how do I do that without increasing the brightest spots? And that's where gamma comes in. If I use the full full range of the display, but now increase gamma, I will increase the majority of the, the dim signal pixels also to become brighter but I have not increased the intensity of the maximum pixels at all. And this is where this, the data is not displayed linearly anymore. And then I can always just reduce the background by sliding from the left. Okay, and if I go back without the range indicator, that's a much better image of the red signal than what I had before because I've used the gamma setting. This is especially useful if you have some bright, bright, bright cells but you are still interested in the dimmer cells as well. And then you can use gamma to brighten the dim samples without increasing the signal of the brightest cells. Right, um, I see the time is almost finished. Um, I wanted to quickly show you different displays. If you have a multicolor image, you can put them into three different colors, editing of course if each one separately by itself. You can overlay. Um, there's many, many different things. I just want to reduce that again. 
and then this is a typical image that you would use in a in a um, publication or so. Something that's very important in publications is to put your scale bar on. Scale bar is usually somewhere in graphics or um, different software for differently in Zen, in Zen it's here at the bottom. Graphics, you have a scale bar and as you can see because we have a, a scaling available for all these images it already gives us the measurement. This was taken with the 10 times objective. If I, you go back to my cells here and I put a um, scale bar on, that's already 50 micron versus this one of 100 micron. It was um, optimized for the, or it is in relation to the objective that was being, has been used. I want to show you a different thing. Um, the difference between this sample, it's the same sample, um, we just edited similarly. Um, so blue, we've had 1668. Oh, what I want, want to also say, because you have numbers available, although you're not changing the data, it's always good to display your images with exactly the same editing. I, I've been trying, I've been changing all these images a lot. And if you change images um, of a set of data, for example, treated versus non-treated versus control, etc., and you change the one image significantly, but you don't uh, change anything on, on a different image. You can actually um, create bias in, in whoever is the viewer. Um, so my recommendation to all our users is choose an image, optimize these settings here at the bottom, say so, okay 16 for, for the blue, um, 68 as brightness, and then you apply these numbers at the bottom for every image. That would be the best way to not bring in bias or um, uh, mislead your viewer of the images because people are visual people that if they see one image is brighter than another irrespective of what your data says or your graphs they would want to see the the, the data to say that the the one image is brighter than the other so always edit your images the same way um let me just quickly get back here um oh, no, no. We had, oh, no, I can't, still can't remember. <sighs> Sorry, guys. Um, 1668 for blue, 16 and 68. And for red, I had 41, 255. And for green, I had uh, 0 and 85. So let's do the same here for green, 0 and 85. You can see that these two images are not the same quality. Let me just go back to 2D. This is not the same quality. So what is the differences? Differences are basically in the, in the name. And I've got a whole set of data. I'm not going to open all of them. But you can see I've imaged samples at a speed of 3, speed of 7, speed of 10. The faster your laser crosses the, or scans through the sample, the worse your resolution. If I can show you the speed of this one is 7, this one is speed 3. It's much better to scan slower. It does, you compromise on your time, but it's better resolution in the end. Um, also better um, signal collection if you scan for longer. That's why we had better blue um, blue the mucus cells. Another thing is um, there's something called uh, we're using a zoom of two and there's a zoom of one. I can't remember why this shows up the same thing. I'm um, not going to focus too much on this. I think I've saved it afterwards but um, there's an averaging of one. Averaging means how many times does it um, scan over the same area and then average the signal instead of just um, giving you the, the result. If you average, of course, you can't average one. So in this image, we the laser went past the, each pixel just once. But if you um, scan through each sample twice, you get a lot more. Um, uh, you you average the, the noise as well, and then you reduce the noise that way because the average of noise is basically zero. You would get um, an event of an electron in one scan, but in the next scan, there won't be any 
um, an, an electron in that specific pixel. So you are averaging it out and you are reducing the noise. Um, also something else that I've compared, if I show you here, um, sometimes if you if you look at a frame size of 512 by 512, you all, will also get a much worse image than a, a sample that has 1024 by 1024. I think this one was saved after I've um, after, I can't actually remember. I'm busy. But basically, in in general, if you if we had a better view of this in a bigger on a bigger screen, we would have seen that 512 is worse than a 0, 0, 0.024 by 0, 0.024 pixel um, frame. Um, but when when you do our confocal course, when we can allow people in the room again, I will show you the differences on a big screen, how these actually change the differences. When you have a Z stack. I actually want to show you what we what's possible with when you have a Z stack. We would basically we can show all of the, the the Z stack in an ortho view. In other words, whatever was in the Z plane up and down, you would see as a sidebar here. But we can also do a, a 3D representation. It takes a little bit of time for rendering. I don't have a very good graphics. I don't have a graphics card, so. Um, it doesn't show very fast, but I have an image open. There it is. Uh, OK, that's showing the, the cell already. But this is from a stem that we've used. I just want to. We've imaged in Z stack and you can then represent it. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, the rendering is really problematic on my laptop. Again, maybe it would be great to have you in our lab and show you all of these things on a big screen, fast computers, not on my laptop, right? So I would like to go back quickly to um, one more slide on my um, PowerPoint. Oh, come on. And then I'll finish off. OK, stop sharing and back to PowerPoint. Uh, back to PowerPoint. Not that. You can just bear with me. Okay, so we've been here at the um, PowerPoint. I went to Zen. Now, if you have watched the video, they have they have gone in detail through a, a whole lot of things that you can do after you have imaged. You can do pre-processing. You can smooth if you have a lot of noise or background in or background. You can smooth the image first so that the background is actually um, reduce. You can sharpen the edges so that uh, edge re recognition can take place. You can reduce noise, do a shading correction, especially if you have um, shading in your image beforehand. It, it will um, influence the, the, uh, the analysis, so you want to do shading uh, corrections. You can do histogram stretching, especially if you don't, if you haven't used the full sp full uh, dynamic range, full all the gray, gray levels, you can do histogram stretching to make sure that you do uh, use the full dynamic range. Segmentation is basically a way to identify the parts of this the sample that you want to actually analyze. If you have a, a cell culture by either thresholding or variance based or even with machine learning to identify the cells or the nuclei or above the background and say I don't want to analyze the background. These are the features I actually am interested in. Then later on, you can um, identify what, what is it that you want to measure. Is it intensity? Is it size? Is it shape? Um, there are many, many things, and I can't go into depth, depth about that, but this video does go into quite depth, so I can highly recommend that you do this. And then there are different ways to um, display your data. You can do line plots, scatter plots, heat maps. Um, so I would especially if you do um, dynamic changes that you can follow plots. There are many ways and the video will explain it. Now, one, one point that no one has talked about yet as far as I can think, and also not in the video, is deconvolution. So a deconvolution is a processing technique which improves the contrast, especially because fluorescence light, um, fluorescence includes a lot of out of focus light. We would like to have um, Images that doesn't have that blur um, in. So it's a mathematical way. 
Um, convolution operation, we're not going to go too much into the into the uh, mathematics about it, but what the whole idea with deconvolution is to try and get rid of the out of focus light so that you can see the image with the best contrast possible. Um, all fluorescence images can be deconvolved, even um, confocal and super resolution images can be deconvolved because in confocal and in super resolution, you still struggle with the limit of the point spread function. And if you can re get rid of that elongation of the point spread function, you will improve your images even further. Now there's different algorithms. I've just included two here, but there's a long list. The first type, which you might see in software as nearest neighbor, multi-neighbor, no neighbor, unsharp masking, that's what they call it in the software. They're called de-blurring algorithms. What they do is they look at the, the one plane at a time and it, it will blur the, the view above or the Z plane above and below and then subtract the blurred images from the image that is currently being processed. Um, so it's an operation uh, applied plane by plane to each two dimensional plane of a three dimensional stack like I have here. So it will go through each different image. And then, uh, yeah, for example, nearest neighbor algorithm operates on the plane Z by blurring the neighboring planes and then subtracting them. And then you get a better, better contrasted image. The next type is a much more um, sophisticated way, but you could get better um, results. The whole idea is to blur in a more three dimensional uh, way, not plane by plane 2D. So instead of subtracting the blur, it is reassigned to the proper in focus location. Um, it is, I'm just going to quickly get to the point. Um, it doesn't re restore it perfectly because it's trying to um, get to the, um, it's an estimation where the in focus light would have been. So let me just get there. Uh, the best that can be done is to estimate the object given the limitations of your, your system. Uh, the restoration algorithms is an estimate estimate the object following the lo logic that a good estimate of the object is where that point spread function center is. In other words, right in the middle, we expect that that fluorophore to be right there. So if you can um, mathematically um, calculate where all of this out of focus light should have been, that is a good way. How does it do it? As I said on, on Monday, Fourier space. I'm not going to explain the Fourier space. I'm not, I don't understand it completely myself, but basically it, it transforms your image into a Fourier um, transformation and then recalculate back where was the actual in-focus light. And the, the resulting image is an in-focus, completely in-focus photo. Um, there's the Fourier transform for those of you who watched Monday. There are many different algorithms. Um, you can go read up on these. I don't know why I've copied this twice. But as you can see, the different algorithms can reduce. This is the original image, and then different ways can give you different results in deconvolution. Now, I am not going to go through all of these. I'm oh, sorry. Um, but there are many different open source um, uh, software you need to go and find out what is the best software to you to utilize your to get your images um, analyzed. Um, I've got here ImageJ. This is the one that most of us use. Cell profile is especially if you have lots of a whole lot of images that you want to batch process. Neuron st study is specifically for neuronal tracing. Um, image stack alignment software. Etc. I see we use this for our correlation of um, CLEM, correlation between electron and fluorescence microscopy. And then if you have background in programming, um, you can use Python and Math MATLAB. Uh, Zeiss has brought out a whole webinar series on Python um, analyses. I can highly recommend them. I haven't watched them yet, but it starts with someone who doesn't know anything about Python, starting at the, I want to say, Python for dummies. And I can, um, if you are interested in going into programmed image analysis, you can start watching that. And then I couldn't, I, I thought I will go into some of these, but I just realized this, there won't be time. If you're interested in spot counting, intensity measurements, morphological analysis, network analysis, dynamic analysis, all of these are, can be done with fluorescence microscopy. Um, there was a question on intensity measurements. The only info I, I could find was that 
when we talk about mean fluorescence intensity, people are actually talking about the mean. They calculate the mean of all the pixel intensities in the image to, um, to report the intensity. Right, I am done. Thank you very much to Zeiss um, for collaborating with SAF this week or the, the past two weeks. Um, I want to, uh, they might now be absent, but for any of the experts who are listening, I, I'm really grateful for the participation of other people to help us when we talked about sample preparation. And then all of you who joined now for five, not, I, I realized not everyone could listen to every webinar, but I, we, it would be a useless um, endeavor to go into this if we didn't have people interested in microscopy. Right, I am available for questions, so I have not followed the chats. Is there someone who would like to ask a question um, that has not been answered in the in the chats? Anyone? You can unmute you. Oh, Saeed, I'm going to listen to you. Yes. Oh, um, I'm struggling to hear you. Are you asking the questions? Can you do mastural analysis and vitrinate reflectance with the microscope that we have? Is that your questions? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, to be honest, this is something that's not familiar with me. So I would, the first thing I would have to say is to explain to me what, not, not now, but maybe in an email, what you mean by mastural analysis and vitrine reflectance. If I remember correctly, you are working with material sciences, no? Or, or, or rocks. What, what exactly are you looking at? Rocks. Now, that's something that I'm not very familiar with because I'm a biologist. But what I always do, whenever there's something I don't know, we, we start communicating by email. I get as much information as possible. What you can also do is to send me papers, example papers of, of the data you would like to do. So in, in short, my answer to you, to all both your questions is I don't know, because I don't know too much about your um, your applications, but I am more than willing to look at the information and then find out for you. Um, I have, yeah. second? I will send you an email. That would be great. Then I can answer in more detail and first find out and get the information that I need. Anyone else who has a question? Uh, Sh Shannon. Yes. Yes, hi Lisa. Um, this hi. might sound like quite a petty question, but I'm struggling to export any scale bars that I load on the Zen software. I can see it in the software, but when I want to export or save that image, um, the scale bar disappears. Is this something you could help me with? Hmm. Um, tell me quickly, are you using Zen Blue or Zen Black? Blue. Zen Blue. Okay. Um, I don't know. So this is something that I would have to look with you. Um, my images usually export properly, but is it, are you exporting in image J or are you exporting in Zen? Are you exporting from um, Zen to put into yeah. image J? I'm doing all my edits on Zen and then saving it as a JPEG to take over. Okay, that that is strange. I know there are some of uh, some of the information that, that doesn't automatically go to Image J. You have to do a scaling step in um, Image J itself, but the in, the raw data will have your scaling information, which you can then in, uh, manually input into Image J. But why it doesn't take the scale bar over? I don't know. To be honest. Okay. Okay. That, that's you. something I think that it's a feature of Image J where it takes more the raw data than it takes um, raw data in your Image J because it, uh, uh, JPEG. Each JPEG also has information. I would actually um, recommend that you actually take the CZI files from Zen to Image J because the JPEG loses a lot of the information, especially if you are editing differently. If you e edit your JPEG for one image differently from another JPEG, then the data won't stay the same once you open it in uh, image J. So rather import CZI files into image J. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, right. 
If there are no other questions, um, quickly looking through here. If you've asked the questions that I haven't seen, um, is it mandatory to put a scale bar on an image for a paper publication? Yes, you. They will not. Um, they will not. Uh, accept any images without scaling. You don't necessarily have to put the scale bar on the image, but you have to have a line then there with known length, and then you have to indicate in your uh, legend or in, in a, a figure legend what the length is of that um, line. Many journals won't accept anything if, it, if there's no scale um, in there. Um, for images where the scale bar was not shown, what would you advise? This is exactly why I said you need to have your raw data available. The scale bar might not be on your image, but because your raw data will have the scaling information, it will allow you then to put a scale bar on after you've um, after you've had your images. Um, yeah. Then I see here something about manual um, sizes of organelles and cell sizes. Um, the the most accurate way is to actually use a proper um, a, a calibration slide with known length. What I understand is yes, cells have typical sizes. Uh, uh, the nucleus is typically about eight to twelve micron. So if someone gives you a scale bar that that looks like fifty micron per nucleus, you can obviously then say no, that that scaling must be wrong. But I would not recommend it to to start your scale bars by yourself as um, manually. I'd rather say put the scaling in that was part of the raw files. Um, anyone else? Uh, I will have to go. What I will do, I will also go through the um, through this, the questions and answer you individually. Um, if I've missed any of the questions that should be discussed. Am I, what have I missed? Um, Mandatory, yes, scale bar. I see there's a lot about scale bars. So is there anyone who wants to answer, ask a question now? Otherwise, I'll finish off and I'll answer the questions um, myself. All right, I guess that was it. Thank you very much for joining. I'm, I see we've run over time again. Um, have a lovely day. You are more than welcome to contact us. What I will also do is I'm going to send you a whole list of links that all of this data come from, things that I can recommend you watch. Um, we've, there's the Python webinar series, the, uh, the other ZEISS webinars, there's, there are documents that people recommend how to use ImageJ. So I can do quite a lot. I can give you quite a lot of um, links. I will send that probably in the next week. It takes me a little while to, to put all of this together, but I will send you as much information that you can keep as a reference file. And then whenever you need any advice, you could use that list. Thank you. I appreciate you and I've really enjoyed this past two weeks. Okay, bye-bye everyone.